Thank you. Okay, uh, I just want to remind you today, before we get started with the more formal part of it, these three resources that I actually popped up um, during the week that I found that came through as, um, as emails, as things that I found um, in the stuff that keeps coming to my inbox that gets filtered out somewhere, uh, with interesting ideas, interesting resources. And so for those of you doing the cognitive side, uh, then there's an interesting topic item here on putting Watson to work, and I know many of you are working on that. And then there are several pe <coughs> people who are looking at autonomous vehicles and that side of things, and there's some rather interesting questions posed in the link, um, in the article that link points to the second link. And then there's a third one about machine learning, which again, many of you are actually looking at. And for some of you, the machine learning will also connect with uh, Watson and will also connect with the autonomous cars where there are quite interesting issues and one of the funny amusing items in a sense but with very very significant governance and uh, safety issues is that it turns out that the Google cars are not terribly good in heavy rain and in snow and at night time in heavy rain or snow they kind of get really confused it's a little bit like us where Often, it's very difficult to see the road markings when you've got no lights, no street lights, and the white markings are beginning to wear out a bit, and it gets difficult. At least humans can cope to some extent with that. It turns out that the Google-type cars, the smart, the sort of self-driving cars, find it really rather uh, challenging. And a lot of work is going to have to be done on this topic. So, three useful resources that you might find help to enlighten you about how to write that really interesting story about the topic that you are writing about and the impact on society. So, some interesting resources for you. I'll have a little bit more to say about the assignment when I come to the end of this bit about making notes before we move into a bit about study skills, about employability skills, the sort of things that people who graduated and then moved on into um, business, or into their jobs, uh, think about what they've learned, what sort of skills they really need in terms of employability, the transferable skills that you can continue to use for the rest of your life, rather than the technical skills which are kind of interesting but are assumed by business when they hire you to be a foregone conclusion that everybody should come out with pretty much the same technical skills but then should be thinking about what are my personal communication skills those soft skills we talked about over the last two or three um, lectures here so first of all how do you while you are doing your research really get value from that research that you can then convert into this really interesting article that you're writing, where you're using a lot of research to find lots and lots of really interesting and valuable sources, which you can then use as justification, in other words, the explanation of why what you're writing is true, that is not your personal fairy story, are disconnected from everything else. Those are the citations that provide to your sources that justify what you're writing. And then you weave that all into this story that you are telling in your own words that really engages with your audience. The sort of things we talked about last week. But making notes is really, really important. It's a way of ensuring that the ideas, the concepts, the facts that you're finding in your resources are then built into your memory and then you can use that for thinking about <coughs> the similarities between different sources, the differences between different sources. That's how you do critical evaluation the sort of thing that we're really wanting to start working on now because by the time you leave university, 
Critical analysis is something that many, many, many businessmen are talking about, and businesswomen, of course. And if you listen to interviews about uh, employment prospects, about the lack of skills of graduates, you will hear many, many times these words, critical analysis, comparing and contrasting. That means you have to have the knowledge in your head. You have to have memorized it. It's not adequate to say, I know how to Google it again. It was like last week I said, when I, I mentioned this. If you just read it, put it into short-term memory, because you know you can find it again, it's not in your memory, in your long-term memory, for you to be able to think about the ideas and compare and contrast many different sources. And note-taking, note-making, is a way of helping you to get the ideas into your head. One of the things that's been very, very interesting over, to watch the research over the last few years, the last <coughs> few years, yes, is the fact that the actual act of writing, whether by handwriting or and keyboard, helps you to get the ideas into your head. If you use a keyboard, it turns out that you learn, you remember many more of the facts, but less of the fundamental concepts. If you write it by hand on paper, by and large, the evidence seems to show that yes, you don't record, remember quite so many of the detailed facts, possibly because you didn't actually spend time writing them down, but you do remember the concepts, the ideas, much, much better. And yes, you can always re-Google the facts, if you really need to. And in some of your subject areas, the facts are often quite important, but go find those again. But it's the ideas, the concepts, why things are important that are so much more important to you, to remember concepts, uh, the scope of things, the implications. And by the, it turns out that we tend to record those in our handwritten notes much more than we record the facts in our handwritten notes. And given that in the sort of things that I'm teaching you, and many of my colleagues are teaching you, it's the broad concepts, the detailed concepts that are really, really important. Because the facts are going to change time and time again. If you think about the packages of uh, software that you're learning and that you will be learning over your next two and a half years here at university, the techniques, the detailed syntax of the packages, the detailed grammar of the packages is likely to change again and again and again. The different buttons that you pu push will change again and again. We know how our smartphone apps keep changing. The interface changes from time to time. And then we have to learn it, it again. But we have that broad concept of how Android or iOS works in broad terms. And that's more important than do I press this button or that button? Because as we live in a world of continuous beta uh, state of all of our apps on our smart devices, and, and a lot of our apps that we use on the PCs. It is more important to know how it uh, what it does than how it precisely works in terms of the buttons that you press or the little areas on the screen that you press. We know that um, if we see what they call the beef burger, the three or four little um, lines in an icon, that means menu. If we see the little gear wheel, we realize now that is settings. And then we just go and explore the settings or the menu to find out what we can do. So learning the concepts, the capabilities is very, very important. And note making and note taking in lectures and in seminars and workshops is how you identify the really important things that you need to remember that you can find.
come back to as you start planning out that assignment for that article. So what this first part is all about, the objective is to identify how you can develop good note-taking and note-making skills. How you build a good outline as you go through a lecture or a seminar or a workshop. Sorry, the wrong way. how you can practice making those outlines. The sort of things you know, I've been going on about and went and really went to town <coughs> last week in the workshop, building that structure of your article. <coughs> and this is about building a good structure for your notes. This is the content. Here, in this big auditorium, whether with me or with Wayne or all the others who are giving more formalised lectures because we've got so many people here. But it's also about those working notes, that structuring, the ideas that you are developing for your assignments. They lead on ultimately to how you're going to structure your dissertation project. And that leads on to how you are going to use this capability to build a structure after your research before you write your reports when you get out into business, when you get out into your job and you're asked to write a report about something. So that's the context. What you will need to do is to, over the next few days, do some research. Find a whole lot of really good sources about how to make notes and why they are useful. Just don't take my word for it, the fact I've been spouting now for five minutes. Go and find other sources who make similar points. Find other sources who maybe contradict that position if you can find any, that is. It may be that so many people say note-taking, note-making, and the way to make notes is so important, that's, uh, the, uh, those are the only sources you're going to find, perhaps. But don't take my word for it. Spend some time this evening, just half an hour, perhaps, maybe even only 15 minutes, to find some sources that tell you why making notes and taking notes is so valuable. And you know, I, mean, I know that many of you spend some time together in small groups with your friends over coffee or all over the place here at the university or in your home, uh, halls of residence or in your flats, whatever. Spend some time discussing the ideas that you have learned from your sources here. This is part of using those uh, many hours a week, those sort of 12 hours a week that you're supposed to be spending on this module and each of your modules. Spend time discussing, because if you discuss ideas with your friends, that's going to help you to remember it better. If you challenge each other, so what? Use a so what question as much as you can. That again will help you to think about justifying your statement. Because we don't like, as humans, unjustified statements. We like to know that there is a reason behind those statements. The reason behind us saying those are facts. Who says? So use the who says as a challenge when you're having discussions about academic matters. And then the second piece of advice is find some sources that tell you how to make notes. And there are many, many, many sources. Almost all in university websites, you'll find some ideas in the uh, study skills section of the University of Derby website. You'll find them there. Lots of resources about how to and why to make notes. 
find those. They will help you to really get to grips with what's going on. And again, discuss it. Because by discussing, you will all have found different sources, different resources about how to make notes, the guidance. And if you have, say, three people together, probably, if you've each found three good sources, you will probably also have found three different sources. So instead of having just three for yourself, with your group of three, you'll have nine different sources. And you can share those sources and build them into your working bibliography of how to study well. So if you work together as in groups, that multiplies the amount of research that you can take advantage of. Whether it's for this little exercise or whether it's for this, the article that you're writing at the moment and submitting at the end of the week or any of the other uh, articles or assignments you're doing. Share that <coughs> research work out between the group. Multiply the effectiveness of that research that you're doing. And if you have created a mind map last week, as I, I suggested you do, then think about the article I'm going to go through in a few minutes, the Enabian Bagley article, which is all about the soft skills, by and large, that businesses expect you to have when you leave here. The soft skills that make you really, really effective as an employee. These are the skills that are actually really, really look for when you are go apply for your job, your placement job next year, about this time next year, you will actually create a CV, you'll apply for several jobs for your placement year. And I was up in um, near Goul last week on a placement visit, and I was talking to the manager of one of our students who was up there. And he was saying that in terms of both applications for placement work and also for their you might say their post-graduation uh, employee searches and recruitment drives, they look to ensure that all the technical part of the CV is pretty much on a par, and they see that all the time. You know, whether it's testing, software testing, or scripting, or particular software packages, they see vast numbers of applications, all with similar technical skills. The problem then comes, how do we, as a recruiting company, uh, identify those applicants that are really going to fit in, who are going to be valuable in our company? And he said that what's really, really important are the things like being able to provide a good, well-written, literate CV, no spelling mistakes, no grammatical errors, that's the first level. If you've got the wrong, if you haven't written it well, if you've got spelling errors, you've got grammar errors, your application will go straight into the round out basket. Won't even be considered. But then they like to see the quality of that communication. And many of you will get a first pass interview on the telephone. <coughs> now, they may have had a hundred applicants for that job that you're wanting to get. And the first turn off to this particular manager was the people who said, ah, um, yes, can you remind me what the job is? Can you remind me what the role is? Hang on, you've applied for five jobs and you don't know which is which. You've obviously not researched the company, you don't know what they're about, you haven't connected them together. <coughs> Any response like that on the phone, your application round out basket, no further con uh, consideration. So communication, being able to be articulate, to be able to remember who the which, what the job is, what the role is, who the manager is, who's recruiting perhaps, what the company does, 
Have you done the research on identifying what that company does? Do you know what they do? That shows an interest in the job, an interest in, interest in that company. And then the ability to actually portray, sell yourself. Tell the story about who you are and why you are so interested in that job. Not, oh, well, I need to do a placement year and I think you might be a good company for me to work in. And by the way, I think you can give me lots and lots of advice and lots and lots of training. That's not what they want. They want to know what you can give them to make it worth their while to take you on. And the guy who was up there, he was one out of a hundred. And he stood out in his application. He stood out in the way that he communicated over the phone and then in the interview <coughs> process actually up at the, the offices. And you'll see in a Navy and Bagley article some of the things that they are absolutely looking for. So the question that comes out of this in terms of employability <coughs> aspects that I want you to be really looking at over the next few days is to work out which you think are the three most valuable of these so-called transferable or soft skills, the skills for communication, problem solving, problem identification, curiosity, inquisitiveness, storytelling, collaboration, all of these things are ref reflected in the 20 or so topics that I'll show you in a few minutes. And then as part of learning about yourself, which again is really, really important, is to start thinking about which of those 20 odd uh, skills do you have and are good at? And then start thinking about how am I going to develop the skills that I'm not so good at? There's lots of opportunities here in the skills uh, sections of our uh, university web pages. There's lots of people that you can talk to. You can talk to your lecturers, you can talk to your workshop tutors and so on. You can go down into the learning centre, the, uh, the library, and find the student skills area. And they will help you develop some of those skills that you could, can see you're not quite so good at. <clears throat> and as you think about structuring as well, as you consider your skills, your capabilities, and the development you need to do, you need to think about, do I need to use electronic mind mapping? Do I need to use paper-based mind mapping? How do I build that structure? Is it on paper? Is it PowerPoint? I know that some of you are building your article structure in PowerPoint. Some of you use it in Notepad++. Some of you are using, it, using Word to develop it. A whole range of different ways. We're all different. We're all <coughs> learning to use different tools in different ways. So the question here is, as you build your ideas about note making, about note taking, about your skill capabilities, your soft skills, even your technical skills development, think about that final question. Does mind mapping work or does something else work? I can't tell you what's going to be effective for you. You have to experiment. It's like with all of our software that we have nowadays pretty much, all of the devices, we have to experiment to find what works best for us. Find some more resources to look at the types of skills. You could look at that Tech Partners um, report, which I shall put up uh, in interesting resources later on today, that helps you understand in terms of software and analytics and general use of information technology, computer science type of products. What it is that are the foundation, the hard uh, skills, the technical skills, and what are those soft skills that are so, so important? <coughs> to 
find three skills that you do not yet have that you can clearly see that you need. <coughs> Practice making some short notes, bibliography, citations and resources, and then also into build into your notes the reasons why these skills that you've just identified are going to be important for you. And if you think about it, to so some of them might be technical, in which case the technical skills needed for the uh, IT students will be different from the computer science students, will be different from the CGP students, the forensic students, and the networks and security students. You will all have different clusters of technical skills. So I'd like you to think about those as well. Because you need those technical <coughs> skills as well as a communication skill. The communication skills will sell you to your future employers. The technical skills are just assumed to be there as a basis. And so we try to give you both the technical skills and those soft skills that will then help you to sell yourself. The, these are the soft skills are the ones you are developing in your writing your article that sells your <coughs> ideas, that sells them to me, to Wayne as we mark them, and we will sell them hopefully to your family, your friends that you're, who you're writing this article for. A bit more research. So you've got some about 20 odd skills in Navy and Bagley. Follow up both in terms of the sources that are referred to or provided in Navy and Bagley because that provides a way into further research. And then also look into the academic uh, uh, publications to look for more recent articles about those 20 odd skills. Find out what's happened since 1999 when Navy and Bagley did their research with 150 odd graduates. See what has happened since then. See whether there is some research coming out of the um, CBI, the uh, Chambers of Commerce. These are the people who are in business who are recruiting you guys. See whether they say that we are now develop, delivering better students. See whether anything has happened in the last 16 years. That'll be Sally trip. And then see how that applies to you because you have to learn things rather than me ramming things into your head. It doesn't work. We know that just giving lectures, pouring knowledge at you, the answers doesn't work very well. The only thing that works is we learn for ourselves. Many people like to think that we can help you guys to learn from other people's mistakes. It turns out by and large that mostly we only learn <coughs> from our own mistakes and from correcting them. And so that's another thing that we try to do here, is to give you a safe environment to experiment, to make your mistakes, learn from them, and move on. So, see how, whether you can find any more relevant skills, or does Navy and Bagley report only, uh, provide you know, the 20 that are mentioned everywhere. If you can find more skills, particularly on the soft skill side, but also on the technical skill, see what you can do in terms of identifying those that are the most important for you. And then reflect. How are you going to learn from that, from what you've just researched? Ask yourself yet more questions. Because some of those skills are useful as a student for learning, being successful as a student, 
Some of those which are going to be a little bit further into the future, getting a job and being successful in a job. Are there any study skills which haven't yet been mentioned either by me or by Nabin Bagley or by any of those other sources that you've explored? And that means you look back at your learning history over the last many years. You've been at school, you've been in college. <coughs> Some of you, as mature students, have been in jobs for many years. So some of you are going to be able to think, ah, but this skill isn't included. Wonder why? Go and research whether anybody else has mentioned that skill and see what they say about it. This is called reflection, thinking back at your own experience and connecting your own experience of real life to what you're learning or being shown in the academic environment. So lots and lots of questions that you need to be asking yourself about being a good student, about learning, about communicating, which is going to be valuable both in your student environment and in your work environment. No answers at all from this, from me or from Nabi Bagley, but a lot of questions you can ask yourselves individually and you can discuss these in groups as well because again because we have different backgrounds we are different people we read things differently so even if we all read navy and bagley all five six seven eight pages of it every one of us here will connect with that article slightly differently We'll read into it different things. <coughs> we'll obtain different messages. And then it's that discussion in small groups which allows us to see other perspectives that we wouldn't have seen ourselves. And I see some people nodding. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's what makes us so different from each other. I could take you down to the roundabout at Mark Eaton roundabout there. And we could stage a little mini accident. And there's about 150 people here, perhaps. There will be 150 and more stories about what happened. We won't see the same accident. We will see different aspects of that accident. Which is one of the problems that police have in witness um, statements, and that's relevant to the forensics people. People will give different statements about the same incident. We hear things differently, we see things differently, we don't even remember accurately what we saw or what we heard. Sometimes we don't even see accurately what's actually written up on the sign or on the newspaper, we see, we read a word, and how many of you have read a word in a sentence and then suddenly, halfway through the next sentence, stop and think, did I really read that word? And you look back and it's a completely different word. Many of you have had that experience. And that's why it's so important to discuss whether here, or in a job, because you may not have seen what was actually there. So, so that's why I provide you with questions that you can use for research, for questioning your research, and then from that have discussions, sharing, sharing experiences, sharing understandings, and trying to come up with something that is closer to what we might call objective truth. So that's the first part. Notes resulting or following on from research, leading to discussion, leading to better understanding. Now, this survey in Navy and Bagley from 1999 or thereabouts is a survey of 148 graduates who were 
mostly in employment. You can find the full details in, in, the, um, in table one before this slide. And these are some of the interesting, what we might call soft skills, that they felt was important to them. I connect the top one, the first one, initiative, to being inquisitive, to being curious, to, you know, to also going out and kind of taking the lead. Let's just see if there's anything at the bottom of the screen. I don't think there are. <coughs> so these are the sort of things Following university, graduates felt were important. There is a slight question over this, in that, that this is a survey of what graduates felt was important, and later on, how good they were at these various skills. It would be interesting for you to find an equivalent sort of survey from the other side, the employer's side. What, what are they looking for? Are they similar to these in terms of the item topics and definitions? How do businesses rank their importance compared to the graduate self-assessment? One of the things that's rather interesting to me is a third one down. Ability to self assess. That's not assessing me, that's assessing your own selves. We do have a tendency as human beings to sort of put some rather rosy tinted glasses on our eyes when we look at ourselves. One of the things I would love you to do, which is really important, is to get rid of those. And to be really, really vigorous, harsh in a sense, in assessing ourselves. One of the most important areas is your future career. Asking questions like, why do I want to become X? Whatever X is as a career. And if, yes, it is about I want a very high paying job. Okay, that's a valid reason. But there are some very interesting consequences of chasing money. Because you need to balance money against work-life balance, against stress in the job, against happiness. And are you looking at your future careers in a really cold Dark, a sort of bright light to understand yourself really, really well. To understand the quality of your work. And we try and help you learn that through our grading um, schemes, our rubrics, to help you understand how the article is going to be assessed or the assignment is going to be assessed so that you have no surprises when you hand the work in and get the grade and get the feedback. If you are good at self-assessment, then as you write, whatever it is you're writing or doing, whether it's code or whether it's a, an, a, an article or a report, you should know how good it is and when it's going to get 55, 65, 75, 85, 95 percent. There should be no surprises at all. I did some an, uh, experiment many years ago with some second year master's students. And we just did a little tiny bit of writing. It was only about a couple of paragraphs long. They'd already had one term, so they'd done three or four modules. They'd had all of their work assessed by their uh, 
tutors. And I wanted to find out whether they were capable of marking each other's work effectively. Did they really understand how those assessment criteria work? And so they wrote a short uh, passage or two, a couple of paragraphs, and then they swapped with their neighbour next door or two down, the, down the, um, the bench. It was interesting to discover that those master's students actually were capable of assessing each other's work within about half a grade. Now that's why on the, at the end of your assignment you have the opportunity to copy in that assessment grid <coughs> that's in the assignment spec and then putting in to those the three columns on to, in terms of the presentation style and then the content and the fourth, third column put in your assessment based on the criteria of what you think I'm going to give you or Wayne is going to give you on those three criteria for that article. You do not have to do it, but I strongly suggest that you do, because that will help you to gain an understanding of two things. One, how we assess your work against those criteria, and secondly, helps you to understand how good you are at self-assessment. So in each of the there's three boxes at the top of the grid, and in each of those I want you to put a number out of a hundred. So have you done all of the things in presentation exactly the right length? All of the proofreading, you checked in Word that you haven't got any spelling mistakes, you haven't got any grammatical errors. Uh, you check that the full stops are exactly at the end of the sentence rather than one space to the right, and so on and so forth. Have you done the citations properly? Have you done the um, references in the bibliography correctly? <coughs> and all the other criteria in the presentation. There's no good reason why any of you should get less than 100% on that first column in actual fact. Unfortunately, many of you will because you haven't checked your work properly. There is an opportunity tomorrow in the workshop for me to help you with the formatting and so on with the template and looking at some of the areas you're going to lose out on if you're not careful. If you turn up tomorrow at the workshop there's a probability that you can gain another 10, 20, 30 percent on your presentation quality quite easily because you haven't quite finished checking it yet. Then in the other two columns, you know, yeah, you might have targeted the 95% level to find a topic in the right-hand column. Check that you've really made the point about the impact on society. So if you do that, you'll then be able to ch check the quality of your self-assessment, your understanding of marking criteria, against what I and Wayne will actually mark you for um, following your submission at the weekend. You'll have the opportunity in many of your um, modules to develop your ability to work in teams. And what do you do if one of the team members actually doesn't do very much? So those of you who are tempted not to do very much, please think about what you're doing to the rest of your team. Because you may have been allocated a, uh, an important part of the task. What happens if you don't do that bit? <coughs> a perennial problem for everyone, students, people in work, everybody else, all of us, Time management. As you look back over the last nine weeks, eight and a half weeks now, we're now into week nine. Think about how you have used your time, both here in the university and outside, to do your studying. Think about 
about how many of you have had a lot of stress in the last few weeks because you had deadlines. And when you've got a deadline for one module, suddenly there's a very strong tendency to say, ah, I need to spend all 48 hours this week working on this assignment rather than maintaining that careful time management of 12 hours a week on each, sorry, a bit more than that, 15 hours a week on each of your three modules. If you end up with that panic of all the hours of the day, all the hours of the week on the one assignment, other things are going to slip. So time management is something that's absolutely critical. Otherwise, you'll get overstressed, and then things will go very pear-shaped extraordinarily rapidly. So the question for you is to think about your time management so far. You've now got eight weeks worth of evidence about your capability. Have you succeeded in balancing each of your three modules adequately? Or are you now into a continuous stage of crisis management? I've got to get the ICS assignment done for the end of this week. I've got another module with a due date whenever and whenever. And then the CBT test just after um, Christmas as you come back in the first week or so of January. How are you balancing all of those pressures? What have you learned about yourselves? so far, and your ability to time manage, and what, and what lesson have you learned to make life easier for, you, for yourself next term, and the term after? And that's linked very much to establishing priorities. How do you learn to establish priorities. Go find out. See if you can find these resources on, in the skill, study skills section about time management. Do you even know where half of your time is going? And to do that, you need to keep a diary, is the best advice, and be absolutely accurate about when you start jobs, when you finish jobs, when you're trying to do three jobs at once. Because it turns out that although the millennial generation, that's many of you, believe that uh, multitasking is a great idea, it turns out that actually multitasking in almost any situation is not very helpful. You don't get as much done, by and large, if you multitask rather than concentrating. And that's true of us as humans. It's also true of computers. If you put a hypervisor onto a computer with multi-cores um, to try and get every last ounce out of the, uh, the CPUs, you discover that quite a lot of resource goes into managing the context, the start, the stop, where I've got to, remembering it, reloading it, and you actually reduce the throughput because you've got a hypervisor trying to do it, you've got the time, as I say, when you load the new context back into the CPU, and save it back out again. And we have the same sort of problems. If you switch context every 10, 20, 30 seconds, that's about how long it takes to bring the, remember the context of what you were doing just before the last task. So multitasking turns out not to be a clever idea, folks. So you've got to set priorities to get the right things done. Give yourself an hour to do a good job. Not four slots of 15 minutes or 10 slots of six minutes. That's not going to work terribly well. And now we come down to written skills, explanation, justification, storytelling. All of these things are important. So there's explaining and written skills at 4.4, 4.3, really, really important couple of the highest scored items out of five. And what you can also see there is the red, the black is how important, and then the white is kind of 
students or the graduates' self-assessment of the quality of their capability in that area. And you'll see that, by and large, they self-assess the quality of their capability considerably lower than the importance. Now, there's an important message, folks, as well. If they are so important, I mean, if we look at explaining 4.4 out of a scale of 5, why is it that they then self-assess at 3.5? A whole, you know, a whole unit less, 20% less capability than they really need. That's one of the things we want to concentrate on with you, is to get your quality up to the same level, if not higher, than the importance. So I want you to get hold of the cop this one. This is up in course resources in week seven, I think it is, week eight. And I want you to really go to town on that re the research I've asked you to do about these what they call transferable skills or soft skills, the things you need to do over and above your technical skills to become effective as students and effective as employees. So I'll see you all tomorrow. By the way, I will put the um, submission point up today for all of you. Wait a minute! For those of you who have valid reasons and you know who you are for delaying a week or two because you've got support plans or whatever, there will be a second submission point. Please do not get them confused. If you have a support plan which gives you an extra week or two weeks, make sure you use the extended submissions submission point, please. Okay, thanks very much. See you tomorrow.